good morning. Would you please stand and join us as we begin our worship and song? your glory it uh, shines within this sanctuary help us to see a glimpse of that today as we look into your word lord bless our time together in the name of jesus christ amen well, i do have a few announcements to make oh here kelly kelly yep. okay i have an announcement from the women's ministry group and next Sunday after church, um, the ladies will have a luncheon and they will reveal secret sisters. And uh, please bring a finger food to share. And even if you weren't part of the secret sisters and you want to be a part of it, please join us to, uh, next Sunday after church. And if you don't want to be a part, you can come to it. But you need to be a woman. The men aren't invited. Okay, gotcha. So guys, you're on your own. Look at McDonald's. Um, there's a lot of announcements in the bulletin, but, you know, we've got an active church, and we were talking about in our uh, submit meeting this morning about the things that happened in, you know, November and December. And, you know, this church is alive, and we've got a lot of activities going on. And as you look through the bulletin, look for a way to plug into one of those ministries. And I just wanted to share tonight... At 3 o'clock, the Grief Share starts a new session for 13 weeks, and Pastor John's leading a class also um, at 5.30. And so uh, come this evening and be a part of those classes, and then look for other ways that you can be involved. I do want to say that, uh, you know, and those, those events are in your bulletin, so take your bulletin and look through them. We are going to have a special business meeting uh, two weeks from now. It's the 29th of January. 
to affirm Dan Vanderstel as an elder, because we kind of forgot to put that on the agenda for the last business meeting. So, and I think all of us would love to see Dan continue to be an elder. So we're going to do that in a couple of weeks. And so we'll have a special meeting right after church. Be real short, but we'd like everyone to attend that. Pastor, I don't have any other announcements. Well, good morning. I'm going to read to you today from Mark's Gospel. And I'm going to begin reading in Mark 8.27. And I'll read through chapter 9 and verse 7. And this is Mark's account of the profession of faith made at Caesarea Philippi. Who is Jesus? That really is what's being focused upon in this text. And so as I read this to you, I want you to think about that question. Who does the Bible claim Jesus to be? Who did Jesus' disciples believe him to be? And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Now Matthew's version adds a couple of words, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said, Turning and seeing this disciple, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels? And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. By the way, those are the words of a man who doesn't know what to say or what to do. Well, that's what the Bible says. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. So this is God's word identifying Jesus. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. We've been talking about our core values as a church, and those values are located in the bulletin week by week in that little section you can tear out of your bulletin. There are eight of them. Uh, today we're dealing with the last 
actually core value seven because I skipped ahead and talked about core value eight some time ago. Let me read to you core value seven. We value worship that pursues joy in God, recognizing God to be a superior satisfaction above and beyond all other desires. That core value is reminding us that every person in this room and every person in Stanfield this morning and every person in Umatilla County and every person in Oregon and every person in the United States and every person on planet Earth is a worshiper. All of us are worshipers. That doesn't mean we're worshiping the right things or the right one, but we are worshipers. We thirst to be satisfied. And if you're not worshiping the God of the Bible, you will inevitably worship something else. There are people today worshiping football, aren't there? And when we worship something other than God and make something else central other than God, the Bible calls that idolatry and it leads ultimately to ruin. Watching a football game won't ruin you, but so much of life when, when you don't put God first and, and you focus on something else, that something else will destroy you. And so we're, we're acknowledging what is simply true of the whole human race. We're all worshipers. We're all pursuing satisfaction. We'll find that in God or we'll try to find it in something else and we will suffer the consequences of that. So we want to experience God as a great satisfaction in corporate worship, but really this statement applies to all of life because we don't stop worshiping when we leave this building. We're worshiping all the time. Uh, So we need to be worshipers of the right one, and that's God. Um, We're going to spend just a few moments in prayer today. And I don't know, is, is um, Sharon here? Does anybody have an update on um, her sister? We prayed for her sister last week who was uh, in the hospital with pneumonia and influenza. Okay. Okay. So her name is Joyce Allen. She is a Christian. She lives here in Stanfield. So we should remember to pray for her. Rita James, there was an email that went out yesterday, has a clogged artery in her neck. And she's in the hospital here in Hermiston. They're trying to dissolve that, um, that blockage through medic- medicine, through medication. And so we should pray for Rita. She's doing fine, but... Um, She needs to have that situation resolved. We've been praying for the Philippines with the storm that struck, and we did receive word that that, uh, some of the monies that we've sent have been used, and they've been used to repair the roof on the church building that's in the midst of that little village. And so that congregation uh, reached out to us and thanked us for uh, serving them and helping them in that way. But we can continue to pray for the Philippines just as that community recovers from that storm. So those are a few things. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for this day that you've given to us. I thank you for the scripture that we've read this morning of, of who Jesus is. That he is the Son of God. That he is the Christ. That he is our Savior. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to acknowledge that and help us to honor Christ and help us to worship Christ, even as we worship you. May we worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit today. We do come to you today as, if we are Christian people, we come to you today as forgiven people. Uh, We are people who have received the the grace of God through the gospel of God, through the work of Christ. And so we rejoice in that. We, we thank you for giving us a Savior. We thank you that you are a redeeming God. We thank you that you do work all things for the good of your people. 
Help us, Lord, to trust you. Help us to find peace in you. Help us, Lord, today to rejoice in you, knowing that we're called to worship you, not because you need our worship, because you are self-satisfied, sufficient in and of yourself. We are called to worship you because it's right to worship you and also because worship is meant to satisfy our own souls. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would help us today as we've gathered in this room for what we call corporate worship, that we will be able to worship you through song and through prayer and through the word preached. So we ask your blessing upon this worship service. We do also remember those that we're aware of uh, who need your special work in their lives. And we do continue to pray for Sharon's sister. We're thankful to hear that she is home. We pray that she will make a full and a complete recovery. We pray for Rita as she is in the hospital today, Rita James. And we lift her up to you. We pray for her. We, we pray that the medicine she's receiving will, uh, will bring healing to her body. I, I pray, Lord, that Rita will will have a, a firm confidence that you are the shepherd of her soul, that she will trust you in this moment of weakness. And Lord God, we continue to pray for the Philippines and that village and the impact of that storm, and we thank you that uh, we are able to reach out to them and that the church there has been able to restore uh, their roof after a tree fell upon it. And so, Lord, we just continue to pray for that community and ask that you would use that storm for good, that it would draw people to you. Uh, and so we just lift up that need to you today. Uh, we, uh, we, we thank you for this day, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we continue to worship, let's say together uh, the Lord's Prayer. Let's stand together and say the Lord's Prayer. And by the way, we're going to have a day of prayer coming up here I don't remember the date. We'll be getting that information in the bulletin. It's a ways off, but we're going to spend three or four hours on a Saturday morning, and our focus is going to be the Lord's Prayer. And so we're going to try as a congregation, all those who want to be a part of this, to pray together through the various petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and part of that is to help us not to, to remember to not make this rote. It's so easy for us to say these words, and it's just rote and to not think about what we're saying. So even today, as we say the Lord's Prayer, let us think about what it is that we're saying and actually worship as we say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
will be having Children's Church and Aaron. Are you doing that this morning? Okay, so if you'll follow Aaron out, third grade and under for Children's Church. Well, we are continuing in worship now as we worship in the Word. Sometimes, sometimes people will say to me and to others, you know, what does your church do by way of discipleship? And we can give a variety of answers to that question. But one of the things that I will always point out to a person who asks me that question, I don't mean to be overly flippant about it, but I'm sincere in saying it. Well, we preach the Word. Because I think when people ask that question, what do you do for discipleship? That's the last thing that they're thinking about. And we do more than that, but we don't do less than that. And so I do hope that as we, as we come to Scripture today that you do think of it in terms of we're worshiping God, but also you think of this in terms of I'm being discipled. This is a text from Scripture being preached that is meant to equip me, prepare me, disciple me to be a better follower of Christ. And so today we're in Psalm 53. So that is where I would ask you to turn. You can almost, if you're not familiar with the Bible, you could almost just open the Bible up to the very middle and you'd quite possibly find yourself in the book of Psalms. And then you would just need to find the 53rd Psalm. Now last Sunday... We looked at two conditions in which a person can die, and I hope you remember uh, some of what I said last Sunday. I said on that occasion that you can die in sin or you can die in faith. And so I want to continue with that theme today and next Sunday and quite possibly the Sunday after that, we'll see how far uh, this goes. But today, just tracking with that theme, particularly the theme of dying in sin, I, I want us to spend some time in Psalm 53 as we consider the fool and the fool's fate. Now, I've not used that language for sermon title or subheadings within the sermon, but that is a good way to divide up this text. The first three verses are really a description of the fool, and then the second three verses give us the fool's fate. And not surprisingly, the fool is the one who is dying in sin. And so we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to begin by just trying to understand the malady, the disease of this particular person. And so let me direct your attention to the first verse, which reads as follows. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, notice the word heart. We think of the word, well, the Greek word is cardia. This is an Old Testament text, but we, we think of cardia, we think of cardiology, we think of the heart that pumps blood through your body. And the ancients, of course, understood there was an organ called the heart that pumped blood through your body. But when the Bible speaks of the heart, it isn't really primarily thinking of that, that biological organ. It is instead thinking about the deepest and the truest you. Who are you at the very core of your person? And so perhaps a, a word that would substitute fairly well, the fool says in the core of his being, there is no God. And of course, the word heart also suggests the idea of a person who might not be willing to say this publicly, 
If you're a young person today and you're in the category of a fool, and you could be, I hope you're not, but there could be a young person here today who really, in his or her heart, in the core of this person's being, at the deepest level of thinking, at, at the level of the, of the worldview that drives how you're wanting to live your life, your, your attitude is, there is no God. You're probably not going to go to your mom and dad and say that. And of course, there's lots of people in the world who aren't going to come out and verbally say that. So this text is di diagnosing, it's going deep, it's going to the core of our being, those things that we might keep secret from others, but God sees all things, including the core of our being, and so he's talking here about a person who at that core level lives. The current of life is a denial of God, a denial of the significance of God, perhaps a denial of the very existence of God. When we read these words, there is no God, I, I think probably a synonym that would come to our mind is atheism. And there were people in the ancient world who were atheists. But I don't know that that is what this text primarily has in view. It's not excluding that, of course. But I think this text is also interested not, not in what I would call philosophical atheism, which is the view there is no God, God does not exist, but I think probably what is more in view here is what is sometimes referred to as practical atheism. And so what do I mean by that? Well, as I've been explaining, it's, it's an attitude of life. It's, it's a belief system. It's basically the attitude that God is irrelevant to me. The existence of God doesn't make any difference to how I think about the world and, and how I'm choosing to live my life. And so I, I think a pretty good word here is actually denial. This text is commenting upon a person who just simply, with his or her life, with one's mind, with one's heart, denies the relevance, the authority, the significance of God. The person who says that, well, God just is not on my radar screen. I would say that even in a culture as secular as ours is, there still are not that many people who fall into the category of philosophical atheism. There are some, you know, the Richard Dawkins of the world or the Charles Darwins of the world. But still, it's a small number. At the same time, I would say that our world, our culture, our community is literally teeming with people who fit into this category of practical atheism. For all practical purposes, in terms of how I think and how I act and how I live my life, God is irrelevant. God doesn't matter. God is not on my radar screen. And therefore, with decisions made in the ordinary living of life, in the course of walking through one's day, such a person is denying God over and over and over again. And so this is the category of the practical atheist. Let me have you turn with me to James chapter 4 to try to put some meat on this skeleton that I've given to you to give you an example of practical atheism. Because in James chapter 4, we have a, a good text 
James is one of the general epistles. You've got the Gospels, you've got the book of Acts, you've got 13 Pauline epistles, you've got seven general epistles, and then you have Revelation. So James is in the second part of our New Testament, one of these seven general epistles. We believe it's a book written by James, the brother of Jesus. Mary had other sons and daughters. Uh, after Jesus was born, Jesus, of course, is unique, born of a virgin, the Son of God. Uh, but Mary and Joseph had other children, and James was one of those. In James chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, we have this text. This is, by the way, the first sermon I ever preached all those many years ago. The first real sermon I ever preached was James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. And so that means I've been thinking about this particular passage for a very long time. And it's as relevant today as it was back then. So James writes, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow... We will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. So if you're wanting to think about this in terms of a picture in your mind, I would invite you to think of a group of businessmen. I don't know how many, two, three, four, doesn't really matter. Probably a fairly small group of businessmen in a room and also to imagine a map, a map of the Mediterranean world, which was the world of, of that time in this cultural context. And these businessmen, they have spread this map out, perhaps on a table or a desk, or perhaps there's a map on the wall. And we have these words to such and such a town. And the word such and such make me think that they are debating among themselves. They're planning their future. A five-year plan. Maybe a ten-year plan. But they're planning. And their goal is clear. They're going to go to this location. They're going to carry out their plan. They're going to conduct business. Their goal is to trade and to make a profit. Now, verse 14 gives us the corrective. What is wrong with these men? You see, they've forgotten something, better yet, someone who is significant to their future plans. They have failed to acknowledge that their next breath is a gift that comes from God. You see how they're practical atheists? They're not sitting down and asking the question, what does God want us to do next month or next year? How does God fit into our five-year business plan? God's missing. He's missing in their minds. He's missing in their hearts. And so they're moving forward as if God is irrelevant and in that way, they're denying his significance. And so the correction in verse 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And that's true, isn't it? Any of you know what tomorrow will bring? Do you have plans for tomorrow? We need to have plans for tomorrow. But as we make plans for tomorrow, are we aware that our plans are contingent upon what God has determined for us? You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. The word translated mist is the Greek word atmos, A-T-M-I-S. It can be translated using a variety of English words, including, as we have here, mist, or vapor, or steam, like the steam that comes from a pot that is on the stove. 
or the vapor in the morning, the dew on the grass before the summer sun causes it to disappear. So vapor, steam, mist, also smoke, like the smoke from a campfire. I've had this experience many, many times of I sit down at the campfire and the smoke follows me. You know the saying, right? Smoke follows beauty. I also sometimes think I have a great face for radio. Smoke. The smoke coming from a campfire that just, the wind catches it and it is gone. You see, all of those word pictures coming from this word atmos are being used to describe the brevity of our lives, how quickly they pass away. We are creatures of eternity stranded in time. Time is the fire in which we burn. However you want to think about this, the older you get, the more you recognize that the Bible is true at this point, our lives are short, our lives are transitory, and we are not in control even of what happens tomorrow, even ultimately of our next breath. And yet how easy it is for people in a culture like ours to totally forget disregard, ignore these truths. Now see, the Bible takes us deeper down and says, when we live this way, what we're really doing is we're denying God. We're denying His sovereignty, His significance. So verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live. I mean, let me read that again. If the Lord wills, we will live. Our lives are in His hands. And we will do this, or we will do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So that's an example, if you will, of practical atheism in real life. Go back with me to Psalm 53, and as you're turning back to Psalm 53, let me remind you of an illustration that I use about once a decade, I think. It's the illustration of your life, my life, being compared to a rope. A rope that has a beginning point, but think of this rope as being like a line that just goes on and on and on with no ending point. That's your life as an immortal soul. You have a beginning point. I have a beginning point. We are not eternal, but we are immortal in the sense that we will live forever. And forever is a long time, isn't it? Now think about this rope that just extends and goes on and on and on. And then think about grabbing the the beginning of that rope and tying a little knot into it. And then think that that little knot represents the 50 60, 70, 80 years of your earthly existence. So you have a knot and you have a line, a rope that goes on forever. And you see, the practical atheist is the person who lives without an awareness of that rope and lives completely for that knot. Now, I'm suggesting to you from a biblical perspective that this is basically suicidal and insane. And yet we have a culture full of people who are doing 
precisely that. So back in Psalm 53, the fool says in his heart, or says in her heart, or maybe it's the heart of an old fool, or maybe it's the heart of a young fool. Regardless, the fool says in his or her heart, there is no God. Another way of just expanding on this idea of the denial of God, I think you could paraphrase the verse, and this is definitely beyond a paraphrase, but I think it's in keeping with what the Bible would have us to understand, so I'll read it this way. The fool says in his or her heart, the God of the Bible doesn't exist. You see, there's a difference there, isn't there? I mean, in other words, there's lots of folks in our culture that so long as God is a bellhop God, they're good with that. You understand what a bellhop is? I mean, young people, maybe not. You don't really do that anymore in our culture. You do sometimes if you go to a national park. If you go to the, one of the great lodges in Glacier National Park, there is still, I believe, a little bell on the desk. And if no one's there to attend to you, you, you ding that little bell. And the idea, of course, is that someone appears. And they appear to do your bidding. Or maybe the bellhop. You got the person who carries the baggage, you see. So it's this idea of God who just is there to do my bidding. I ring the bell and God shows up. He doesn't make any demands of me. Basically, I'm God, and God is here to do my bidding. So you see, people don't really have a problem with that. And so when we read, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, I think it's legitimate to say that so for many people, it's the God of the Bible doesn't exist. The fool says in his heart, the God of the Bible is irrelevant. In other words, we're universally spiritual. Even in a secular culture like ours, there are so many people who are spiritual, but they're not godly. You see this everywhere, don't you? One of the ways that I see it, and it always stands out to me, is when I I'm going through the news, and I do that a lot. I do it way too much. I'll get my phone out. I'll look at the news sites, and you'll see someone's picture, and you know who that someone is, and it's someone who's living a life in complete defiance and denial of God, and yet that someone has a heart, I mean, has a cross around her neck. I always notice that. It strikes me as so strange. As I read earlier in Mark's gospel, right? Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Submit to me, obey me. And here's someone who's doing none of that. And yet they're spiritual. And so they take a sacred sign of Christianity and use it as, a, as an ornament around the neck. You see, it's the God of the Bible that we don't like. It's the God of the Bible that our culture rebels against. And why would this be? Well, let me remind you just briefly of four of God's attributes, four of God's characteristics. In other words, let's do for just a moment here some theology proper. That's the way the theologian would put it. Who is the God of the Bible? And of course, we could say so many things. And I can't say everything. Well, let me give you four thoughts. Number one, the God of the Bible is sovereign. That means he rules and he reigns. And that means, of course, that every single person on planet Earth is ultimately 
accountable to him because he's sovereign. Number two, God is righteous. This means, of course, that God always does what is morally right. God loves righteousness. He is allergic to sin. He is violently opposed to sin. And when we think about God being righteous, we don't want to think in these terms that there's some kind of standard of morality that is above God to which God conforms. No, the righteousness of God flows out of God's character. So God defines what righteousness is. So he's sovereign, he's righteous. Thirdly, God is omniscient. Now what does that mean? It means that God knows everything and everyone. So when we read this verse, the fool says in his heart, well, God knows what's in his heart. Because I can't see your heart. And your spouse sometimes can't see your heart. And if you're a parent, you very often cannot see the heart of your son or daughter. But there is a God who is sovereign and who is righteous, and he sees your heart. And he sees everything in your heart, and he knows everything. He sees through you clearly. And then fourthly, God is immutable. That's a big word. It just simply means that God does not change. God doesn't learn. You see, if you learn, you change, right? God doesn't grow. If you're a little child and you're wanting to grow up to be a big, strong man, well, you see, you're changing. God isn't like that. God isn't growing weaker like I am. I didn't always have a face for radio. I used to be better looking. God isn't like us. He's not fading away. He's not losing any of his potency. So God is immutable. He cannot change. And that means that God who is sovereign will always be sovereign. God who is righteous will always be righteous. God who is omniscient will always be omniscient. God knows everything that every one of us has done this day. And you see, when you put these attributes together... They are either attributes of great comfort or they are attributes that put great fear in your heart. At least they should. If you're a believer, these truths are great comfort. I need a God who doesn't change. I need a God who has the right stuff. I need a God who takes me in my weakness and puts me into his arms. But what if I'm denying God? Can we be honest for a moment? If you're sitting here today, and some of what I'm saying really does describe your heart and how you conduct yourself and how you're living your life, God is irrelevant. God is not on my radar screen. I'm denying God in many aspects of my life. And if that's true of you, than to think that he is sovereign and you're accountable to him. He is righteous and he knows every unrighteousness in your life. And God is omniscient. Nothing is lacking. His examination is complete. I'm sure you're aware of the the situation in Idaho involving these four young college students 
who were murdered in bed or in their beds brutally and how now there's an arrest that's been made. And in the weeks leading up to that arrest, there was criticism of the various police agencies. They're, they're not doing their job. They're incompetent. And now there's a lot of people backtracking and saying, wow, what an impressive investigation. It looks like they've got their man. And they'll make a case, won't they? And they'll present their evidence. And I'm assuming their evidence will be convincing. But even those investigators won't know everything. They're not God. God knows everything. And so when the judgment comes, the God who knows everything will make a case that involves every relevant fact. And to, so, so you see, to fall into the hands of this God and to be outside of Christ, I can't think of anything more terrifying than that. And yet the average American just goes along living in practical atheism, denying God. What a terrifying thing to be doing. Now, the rest of this text, let me read some additional verses to you. And by the way, I am not categorically denying the possibility of an atheist, whether philosophical or practical, who models civic virtue. I'm not saying that atheists are automatically more wicked than the rest of us. There is something called civic virtue. And atheists also obey the, obey the laws because guess what? They don't want a ticket. I had an example of this recently. I was driving down to Portland. I won't go into all the details of the story. Some of you are sure aware of it because people talk. My wife loves to share. But we're driving along and all of a sudden in front of me, all I see are all these red lights. All these people have their brakes on. They're slowing down. Not to the speed limit of probably 70 where we were at, but let's go like 55. What's going on? Well, they've seen the state trooper. You've noticed this, haven't you? All of a sudden, everybody slows down. Everybody becomes very moral because nobody wants to get a ticket. And there is something called civic virtue, where people do the right thing. You see, the problem is that they're doing the right thing, but they're not doing it for the right reason. Because in Scripture, we're called to obey God because we love God. We submit to Him because we want to serve him. Now here's a key question. And I think it's probably this question that got me thinking about Psalm 53 and this sermon in the first place. So let me read you this key question. What is the general trend in a society that increasingly rejects God? What's the general trend? What's the general trend when you take the Ten Commandments out of the school building? Right? I mean, that's before my time, and I used to just sort of, I don't know, I don't know what to make of that. But now with all these school shootings, I kind of wonder. Do you sometimes wonder? The Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not kill, but we can't tolerate having that in our schoolhouse. And we have shootings. But whether it's that issue or any other issue in our culture, we could think of a dozen different issues. What is the general trend in a, in a society that increasingly just denies God, rejects God, turns its back on God, and lives, as I've described here, a society living in practical atheism? And let me read to you now 
in a sense, I've just given you the introduction. They are corrupt. You see, there's a consequence of denying God, of just pushing God out of your mind, of saying, I will not have God in my world. God who is good. When we push God out, we're pushing the good out. You've noticed this, right? I've said it before. God, G-O-D, good, G-O-O-D. You're supposed to make a connection there. The two words are connected. They're related words. If you will not have God who is the good in your mind, in your heart, in your life, are there consequences for this? They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven. Now, does God need to get out a magnifying glass? No. See, this is a statement of God's, the height of God, the God who is above, the God who is transcendent. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. And boy, I tell you, the word together, that's a significant word. It's the idea that sinners love company. You can sin by yourself, but you'll sin more with others when you've got someone to encourage you. I mean, let's, let's just live in defiance against God together and let's just celebrate this. In fact, the idea is everywhere, right? It's they are corrupt. It's not you are corrupt. It's plural. They are corrupt. They have fallen away. Together, they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. By the way, where does the New Testament pick this language up? I'm sure some of you know. Which, which Paul in epistle is it? Romans. Which chapter? Three. Although one's a good guess too. One and three, it's a set. Through that whole section, Paul's making the same point. He's talking about the universal fallenness of the human race. Romans 1, how we've denied God. We will not tolerate God. We will not have God in our minds, in our hearts, in our thinking. And then finally, by the time he gets to Romans chapter 3, what Paul does in that section is he he goes through the Old Testament and he pulls out a number of different verses in different passages. But many of them are from Psalm 53 or the parallel text, which is Psalm 14. They're almost identical. And pulling out all of these passages from the Old Testament, Paul, if you will, like a seamstress, he stitches them together. And Paul, like a lawyer, this is his final argument. After these words, he says, I rest my case. It's Romans chapter 3, probably somewhere around verse 11, I believe. The world is corrupt. The world is fallen. The world is not seeking God. The world is lost. The world is deserving of God's judgment. And I'll just make this observation. Aren't you grateful that the book of Romans doesn't end with chapter 3? Because you see where Paul takes us in chapter 4, 5, and 6, and really through the rest of the gospel, is to the gospel. In other words, Paul is arguing from a position that people will not really recognize the good news until they are fully confronted with the severity of the bad news. They won't really love the light until they understand the darkness. The darkness in their own heart. And so I would also, along with Paul, say at this point, God is gracious, and God is good, and God does forgive repentant people. And right now is the time of salvation, and so right now the preacher says, come to God. 
If you're living in defiance against God, forsake that. Repent of it. Come to God and He will receive you through Christ. Because all of our darkness, Christ took it when He died on the cross, didn't He? And so we're talking about primarily dying in sin today, but I want to remind you of this other theme that we're going to be looking at in coming weeks of dying in faith. There's one way to God, and that's through Christ. Because Christ alone can deal with your sin issue, your shame issue. Christ died on the cross for our sins. And if we come to Him, He does forgive us. Amen? But what if you refuse? See, this psalm doesn't really take us to the gospel. Let's look at the second half of this psalm. We're going to do this quickly because I know I've taken up a lot of your time. The text divides again into two sections, the fool's character and the fool's fate. You want to think in those terms. We've looked at the fool's character, and now what can we say about the fool's fate? Look at verses 4, 5, and 6. Have those who work evil no knowledge. I've got to just stop there and say, we have knowledge. Everything we've talked about this morning, we're without excuse. Those who work evil have no knowledge. It's, it's a willful rejection. Who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God. There they are in great terror where there is no tear, for God scatters the bones of him who encamps against you. Now the second stanza of verse 5 is difficult. Let me read to you the NASB rendering. It reads this way. Where, there they are in great tear where no fear had been. In other words, I think this text is taking us forward And it's just simply confronting us with the truth that all of us are responsible before God and someday all of us will stand before God and someday all of us will have to give an account to God. And are you ready for that? And what will you say at that moment if you've lived a life of denying God and now all of a sudden you cannot deny You're in the presence of your judge. And you have knowledge. And the text is describing people who eat up God's people. We read that. They eat up my people as they eat bread. They do not call upon God. But then they have to stand before Him and give an account. And we read God scatters the bones of Him who encamps against them. You, God, put them to shame, for God has rejected them. You see, this text is meant really to speak comfort to God's people. Do you see that? And how it does it? God's people who sometimes are filled with fretting, sometimes are filled with confusion, sometimes are filled with frustration. It's the age-old frustrating question, why is it, O oh God, that the wicked seem to prosper so much in this world? And that's true, isn't it? You see, here's the answer. They prosper for a very short season. And then like as if in a dream, they are awakened to reality. And God is the center of reality. And they have to deal with the one they've spent their entire life denying and ignoring. If I could speak any word to President Joe Biden and to former President Donald Trump, the message would be the same. 
it would be this. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? So Congress just passed the Respect for Marriage Act. Perhaps you've heard of it. It is wrongly named. It should be called the the Disrespect for Marriage Act. President Biden signed it into law. From what I read, he had a thousand guests to the White House for a big celebration, and he invited the drag queens. Now, when I read that, I just have to tell you my response, and my response was this. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Ahab and Jezebel. This is the world that we're living in. And I mentioned Biden, I mentioned Trump. I don't want to be overly political here. These two men are lost. They might be lost in different ways, but they're lost. Now, they're elites. I can't speak to elites. I just get to speak to common folk like you. But I say to you this morning, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? And so the Bible talks about a great reversal where those who are high in this world are brought low and those who are low in this world are made high. Let me close with this true story. And I share this story also about once every 10 years. My brother is a physician. He's a medical doctor. I've said this before, he's Dr. Hurty. You want to go see Dr. Hurty? I'd rather see like Nurse Niceness. But he's Dr. Hurty. And he was making his rounds in the hospital, and he had a patient on the floor who was dying, very near death. And this patient had fallen into a comatose state for, I believe, a couple of days. My brother happened to be in the room at the moment when a mini miracle happened and the patient awoke and was fully conscious but extremely weak, couldn't even speak. My brother realized that medically speaking, there was absolutely nothing he could do for this person. And so, if you will, he set his stethoscope aside and he shared the gospel. He talked about Christ. He talked about repentance of sin. He talked about knowing Christ as Savior. This is the thief on the cross, right? At the very end. My brother described to me years ago how this ended. He said, the man who couldn't speak, nevertheless, with every ounce of his remaining strength, shook his head defiantly, no. Shortly thereafter, he lost consciousness and he died that very day. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his own soul? Father God, Father God, you are the Savior of men and women, boys and girls. You save through Christ. You save through the gospel. You only save through the gospel. You save because Christ is fully man and fully God, truly man and truly God. As man, he's able to go to the cross truly, fully as our substitute to take our place. As God, he's able to bear the burden of of sin and to pay a price that has infinite value and worth. The way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who find it. The way is narrow that leads to life. And that life is through Christ. Lord God, I thank you for my salvation. 
I know that I am not saved by anything other than the grace of God. And Lord, I pray that every person in this room would know Christ as Savior, would know the joy of forgiveness of sins, would know the joy of of having shame roll off his or her shoulders, to know the joy of being set free from and by you, the sovereign God, the righteous God, the omniscient God, the immutable God, saying, you are forgiven, be at peace. Lord God, I pray that we would know that peace and know that joy and know that it comes through Christ alone. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen. What are we singing for a final song? Grace greater than our sin. That's my dad's favorite hymn. It's 107, is that right? I I grew up singing that song because most pastors choose the final song. I do. And if my dad was the pastor, so he chose the final hymn. And that's his favorite hymn. So what do you think we sing a lot? Grace greater than our sin. It is a great hymn. It's full of the gospel. And by the way, if you need to respond to God today in some way, do so. If you want to come forward and talk to me or someone else, do so. If you're a Christian and you want to just make a recommitment of your life to Christ, do so. Respond in your, the seat where you're at. If you want to come forward and respond in that way, do so. Let's pray and let's sing.
say one more word. If there's someone here today who's thinking, Pastor John, you're just, you're just, you're overstating the seriousness of sin. Someone could say that. Pretty, pretty negative stuff. And man, it's just, just, you're overstating the seriousness of sin. Well, if you want to know how serious sin really is, look at the cross. I mean, what do you see there? I mean, you see bloody agony, don't you? And we believe in a penal substitutionary atonement. Jesus is punished for our sins. And so, so often we say, well, look to the cross to see the love of God. And that is true. But look to the cross to see the hatred that God has for sin. And then you know what you'll say? You'll say, John, you understated it this morning. You didn't do justice at all to the glory of God and to the awfulness of sin. All right. Well, we will close our service today by saying the Apostles' Creed. So let's say this creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father God, we just said together that we believe that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. We also said together that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that our sins, not in part but the whole, were nailed to the cross and they are forgiven by repentance and belief in Christ for our salvation. We ask, Lord, your blessing upon us as we walk into this world. May we walk with an awareness that we are under your gaze, but we're also in your care. That you rule over this world. That there is great comfort for the saints in that knowledge. May it comfort our hearts and our minds. These things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight. Oh, tonight. Yes. Tonight. Thank you, Harry. Well, i got to say something. Well, we had the opportunity for that, and you didn't. No, I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking. I, I want people to respond, and you're responding, so I'm... Well,